A continued engagement with history is vital as it helps give context for the present. Our guest today is a native of East Preston, Nova Scotia, who has received the Order of Canada, Honorary Doctorate, and many other awards for her literally tireless work in the Black community. Reverend Dr. Joyce Ross also works with the prisons and provides immense support. Dr. Royce joins me now. Welcome to the show, Reverend Dr. Ross. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Same here as well. <laughs> Firstly, I would like the community to know a little bit more about you. So who is Reverend Dr. Ross? <laughs> well, Reverend Dr. Ross was born in the community of East Preston. Uh, I was born in 1939 and I was born to the parents of Edith and James Colley, who had 20 children. 10 boys and 10 girls, and I'm the second of the oldest. I was married to John Ross and I had six children. And I have uh, 14 grandchildren and 19 great-grandchildren. That is amazing. What does it feel like being um, the second child out of 20 children? Well, it's a good feeling because my mother, it was two girls first and then 10 boys and then eight girls. And we had the responsibility of doing everything. You know, there was a, a saying that there's separate duties for boys and separate for girls. Well, being the two oldest, we did everything. And living in a predominantly black community in the county where we didn't have all the facilities, then uh, we didn't have all the indoor facilities that was uh, other communities had. And so we had a lot of work to do. My father had a farm and and. He, we had to work on the farm. We planted vegetables. We had to cut wood. You know, the girls did as much as the boys. So, and even when the boys came along, my mother taught them the same thing. All my brothers can cook a meal. And even some of them can bake. So we were all taught all how to survive and how to take care of ourselves. That's amazing. So thinking about um, the community, the black community from the 50s and 60s until now, what would you say has improved or changed within the community? It's a lot has been changed in the community. I mean, there was when we walked to school, uh, we had no paved roads, but then the roads is paved in the community now. We have lots of transportation. We had school bus transportation. The education system is opened up and exposed. It's more easier for us to get education now. Back in the 50s, that wasn't so. When I was 14 years old and I was in grade eight, in our elementary school, uh, if once you got in grade eight, where there was no high schools in our district, we had to pay to go to city schools. And if you couldn't afford to, then you had to go to work and do domestic work. Because back then, no matter how much education you had, black people always got domestic jobs. I was tall, I was slim, I was in grade eight, and that was as far as I could go in school. So I was able to get a job because then you didn't have to show proof of your age. So I got a job and I worked for 14 years as a domestic. And uh, after that, there was a gentleman who came from Jamaica who was a principal of our school. And he had a meeting with the Darkness Rotary Club pleading with them to hire black people. So one black girl from the community got a, a job in that store. I said, well, this is it, enough scrubbing floors and making beds. So I came back to the community and I organized adult education so everyone like me who dropped out of school would have a chance to go back and pick up where they left off at. And the majority of us went through and we wrote our GE test, GED test and we <clears throat> got our grade 12. And then I was enrolled in Mount St. Vincent as a mature student. And I took sociology and psychology there and the rest is history. When I read through your history, uh, it, I did see there that you are also involved within the prison ministry. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, yes, back in the 1980s, there was a number of our young men going into the prison system. And I felt that uh, if they are in the prison system, I wanted them to know, yes, you made a mistake. God still loves you. So I start going into the prison system with love in my heart, letting them know God loves you and God is a forgiving God. So no matter what the situation is, you can turn your life around. You may have made some bad choices and you got caught in your bad choices. But that's not the end because there's people still out there walking around that maybe did a worse choice than you did, but did not get caught. So I taught them 
how to love and how to forgive because God wants us to do that. And when you do that, you can move forward. And I started in, in uh, nine, I mean, 1980 and I'm still involved. And I've seen people that came give their heart to the Lord in prison. I helped to baptize women in prison. Uh, men came out and got baptized. And every place I go, I run into someone who acknowledges me as being helping them in the prison system. And when I went, it's like a gift from God. At that time, I didn't have a certificate. And after being at the daycare center for 36 years and I retired, and so I decided I seen a course online at Acadia Divinity College, so I applied for it. And when I went, they said to me, uh, uh, you need to have a, a take a degree in order to get that diploma. And, and uh, I said, well, what is that? And they said, you have to take the Master of Divinity or the Bachelor of Theology. So I says, okay, I have to think about that 65 years old. I don't know about going to university for four years. And so they sent my pastor a letter and they sent me one saying I was admitted into the Master of Divinity. I says, oh, I says, I know I'll go back. And so I did. And then they taught me the courses and I was hoping that I would fail so that I wouldn't have to do all that studying. The evangelism was my first subject and I passed with an A plus. I says, well, I guess you can prepare yourself for study. So I did it eight years in uh, part time. And I got my diploma, and that's all I wanted, is a diploma. I did not want to be a minister to preach. But then when I finished, and Dr. Harry Garden said, you've done the work, why do you not want to be ordained? I said, because I'm not going to be a preacher. I want to work outreach ministry, and I don't need to be ordained to do that. I got my certificate. I got what I wanted. And so, but he persuaded me that you did the work, so I'm going to recommend for ordination. And he did, and I was ordained eight years ago in my church. There he was transfigured before them. His face shined like sun. Uh, you know, she, we had a pastor from Florida and she left. And then uh, while we were waiting to, still waiting to get somebody, they asked if I would fill in until they got somebody. So I filled in for two and a half years at our church until we got somebody else to take over. That is really amazing how you went head in, you knew what you wanted and just went for it. I think the next question for me would be, I know a couple of years back, the first black president of America came uh, to Halifax, Nova Scotia. And what was it like seeing the first African-American uh, president of the United States being elected? It was awesome. It was a joy for every black all around in Nova Scotia and Canada. We were just as proud as the people in the United States to see this become a reality. And we here in Nova Scotia had celebrations as well. And we know that he had struggles, the things that he had to cope with, but God brought him through. He was strong, he did a successful job, and when it was time for him to be re-election, we were all praying that he would get re-elected for the second term. And he did, but we know it wasn't easy. We know there's still a lot of racism around in the States and here in Canada as well. But he persevered, he persevered and he trusts God and he was well-educated. What would you say is the role of education in the life of the black people, uh, the black community and people of color? I think that education is the number one. Education is priority. There was a time when it was hard for us to get the education, but now it's a little different. It's more easier for us to be educated. We don't have to pay to go to high schools anymore. We have high schools within our district and we encourage people to take to, to do that, to go and get your education, because without education is nothing you can do. And, and we need to educate our people about ourselves because people, we've been put down so much, people think that blacks do not have anything to contribute, but we do. And I know when I did the adult education, we had a black history class and one lady said, why are you doing black history? I said, because we need to be taught as to what we have accomplished, blacks have accomplished. And at the end of the class, she says, I thought this was useless, but she said, I'm so proud now. She said, I'm glad I came. I learned a lot. I said, and when you know what you have accomplished and you know how far you come, you know how hard you worked, you can appreciate yourself and don't let anybody put you down. Be bold and be strong. And if you're bold and strong and just take no back seat, because we are all created in God's image. We are all his children. And so 
Let us think about that. I never think about color barriers when I'm doing anything, but I always remember that uh, we always try to work so hard to see ourselves that's above us. When I had the daycare center, I had every nationality uh, taught to the children and I had pictures on the wall of our folks who did things like firemen, policemen, doctors, and there's all black so that the young kids could see I can be any of these when I grow up. And, and a lot of them did. And so they're very successful. Thinking about the Nova Scotian community um, from the 50s till now, what would you say has kind of turned around and changed? I think there's been a major change. We now have a black culture center in Cherry Brook and that culture center is the most wonderful place that you can go. If you wanna know black history and where we come from, how we got here, and uh, the struggles that we went through, the communities that's here, we had 52 black communities. I live in East Preston and East Preston, North Preston, Cherrybrook, North Preston is the largest black community in the province of Nova Scotia. And these three communities, East Preston, North Preston, Cherrybrook, we are the largest black population in Nova Scotia. And if I'm not mistaken, I think in Canada. Wow. And we have a lot of people that well educated themselves and came out of our community. We have doctors, we have nurses, we have psychiatrists. We have any profession that you need came, came from East Pre from the Prestons, the township of Preston. A couple of years ago, I had a, a co committee together and we uh, organized to bring everybody home because there was so much negativity about the black communities. I felt that let's do something positive. And so I brought all the three communities, we got together and we put on a major function and we called it the Preston Township. Everybody identifies themselves now as the Preston Township, not the separate in, we still have our own identity, but we are the Preston Township and we are powerful. We have a lot of talent and it's a good place to come. So when anybody says that Preston is not a good place to come, they're mistaken, come see. The only way you know is coming to our communities and see what we have accomplished through housing development, education, you name it, we have it. We have beautiful communities. Talking to the young people now, what would be your advice to them? My adv uh, advice to them is, you know, be calm, <laughs> be patient, be humble because now, and listen, be a good listener before you speak. And uh, don't be harsh and don't get rid of anger. If you have anger in your system, Pray for God to take that anger over your system and respect, have respect for yourself. But first, if you don't respect yourself and if you don't love yourself, then how are you going to work in an environment or work with people? But first, you got to be proud of who you are, love yourself and know that you don't have to take a back seat to nobody. So what's the next venture for Reverend Dr. Ross? Well, I think I should retire. It's really <laughs> hard for me to say no, but uh, I still, there's things, I like. there's some things that right now I'm trying to complete. Okay. And when I get that done, I mean, at my age, I don't know how long I'm gonna be here. Only God knows that our days are numbered. I, I don't have a plan to, to do anything major okay. because I felt that uh, I have made my mark and, and I feel that God has led me a mighty long way. And I feel, I don't feel unhappy about the things that I've done because I feel that I didn't do it all alone. I had God and I had people that work with me. No one is an idol. You got to have others to work with you. And I could always get a group of people who would be willing to work with me. It wasn't easy, but it was doable and we succeeded. That is such an amazing story. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ross. And that was Reverend Dr. Joyce Ross, a prominent leader in the Black community of Nova Scotia. Remember to subscribe to this channel for more content like this. Click on the notification bell and get notified whenever we post a new content. Thank you for watching. I am Oni Olija. See you soon.